When using the default column settings in Webflow, we can run into overflow and inconsistency issues. Even though these two sections are the exact same design, if one of them has a longer heading, it's going to force this column to expand and the other one to shrink, and now we have some inconsistency. If any elements inside our columns have a size applied, even if they have a max width, that column's going to expand with the size of this element and force the other column to shrink. That's especially an issue on mobile. So if we reduce our column count here, if any element inside any of the columns overflow, it's forcing now all of the elements to overflow. So we watch when this heading starts to overflow, it's now forcing the image, the paragraph, and everything to overflow. So this can be one of the most frustrating parts about grids, and the Lumos grid utilities solve this automatically for us. Now the way to solve it is to switch each column to a min of zero pixels, max of one FR. When we're dealing with larger column counts, like a 12 column grid, that can be really tedious to apply without a utility. But once we have that set, no matter what the size of the content is inside, it's just forcing this content to shrink and fit within the column. Now, once we reduce our column count, we'll notice that as soon as one element starts to overflow here, it's now not forcing the other elements to overflow. Another problem that Lumos Utility solved for us is being able to link column and row settings to class name. So with the native Webflow features, if we set this to span over two columns, it creates a pink label, which means an ID is automatically generated on this element. With Lumos, no IDs are created. That means this style is saved not on the class name, but it's specific to this one element. So if we have other hero titles throughout our site, we have to manually go to each one of them and set them to match. And then if we make a change across breakpoints, we have to remember to keep that updated when using the native Webflow features. One more thing that the utilities help us solve is reducing or removing the column count across breakpoints. So if we leave a 12 column grid set on our mobile breakpoint with a one rim gap, that means we have 11 gaps in here, so 11 rims of space which means if the user increases their font size or even on smaller screens, those 11 rims begin to overflow outside of this parent and cause the rest of the content to overflow as well. So that's why we don't wanna just leave a 12 column grid on mobile and set these items to span all 12 columns. We usually want to reduce our column count across breakpoints. Let's set up our Lumos grids. So we'll open custom code and open the base embed. And right up at the top, we have the global column count for our design. Most sites work with a 12 column grid, so it's perfectly fine to leave this as is. But if your site was designed on a 24 column grid or maybe a 10 column grid, we could update that here and it's going to update the grid guides, a lot of the grid utilities, and just everything will be based now around this 10 column design. I'll go ahead and change that back to the default of 12. And another thing we might want to update is the gap used on all of our grids. So if we go ahead and open variables actually and search for grid gap main, this is the main gap used throughout our site, and we can go ahead and change that to whatever we'd like to match our design. Now, let's go ahead and apply a grid. So if I select this blog list and I type U grid, these are all the different grid classes we have. Think of these like tools in your toolbox. They each serve a different purpose. So here we have a two column, three column, and four column grid, and these are just automatically responsive. So if we need to quickly create a two column grid, don't want to touch the responsiveness on mobile at all, we could just throw that on. It's two columns here and here, and then it eventually switches to be a single column. And we can also make changes. So if we want more space between the rows here, we can edit our row gap, and we could throw on maybe a space medium to push these cards further apart. Now let's say we have multiple of these blog lists throughout different pages of our site, and later we decide we want to change the design, so all of these use a four column layout instead. Well, we can just rename this class, add four in, and all the overrides we applied to the blog list are still in place, but here now it's using the predefined four column responsiveness, so it'll switch to two columns here, and it'll switch to one column here. And this is great because let's say this would have switched to three columns, one tablet, then we'd have a card on its own row by itself, which isn't quite what we want. So if you have a simple list of maybe you want to show four features or four benefits or something, um, then just throwing on a quick four column grid is a great way to go because we're never going to have to worry about that odd item on its own row. Let's say we have a list of three items we wanna show, just quickly throwing on this three column grid means it's not gonna to switch to two columns and leave an item on its own row. 
it'll stay three, and then it'll switch to one when it needs to. Another grid class we have access to is auto fit. So if we go ahead and rename this class to auto fit, what we'll notice is our columns by default have this minimum width of 13 rim. And before the columns become smaller than 13 rim, our column count will just automatically reduce. So this isn't even tied to a breakpoint. Here I'm staying on one breakpoint and it starts as a three column grid. But before the columns become smaller than 13 rim, it reduces to be a two column grid here. Now, there's no way to skip from three columns straight to a one column. It has to go through all of them. So because of that, this is better for a longer list of items. But what's nice about this, too, is it's more accessible. So usually we might set this to a three column grid on desktop, manually reduce it to two columns on tablet. But if the user increases their font size, the text would get larger and there wouldn't be enough space because it's stuck on three columns. Well, with auto fit, when the user increases their font size, not only does the font get larger, but the column count also reduces. So now it's a two column grid and we're still on desktop. And if we increase it enough, now it's a one column grid and we haven't left desktop. So this can be really great for accessibility, just having these be automatically responsive for us. And another great benefit to it is say this is a maybe related articles at the bottom of an article page. And we're not sure if we're only going to have maybe two articles. Sometimes we might have three or four. Well, this can just grow and shrink with the number of articles we have since we're not defining a set column count here. This is great too for like conditional items. So another thing we might want to do is maybe we have a grid of four items, but we want to make sure that it stays at least two items per row. Well, what we can do, let's check right above our max width, is we need to increase the minimum size of these columns. So we might try something like a min width of 27 rim, and that's just enough to fit three columns on a row. Let's try 28 rim, and it looks like that is fitting our two columns per row. So once we have that set, it's going to continue to automatically reduce where it needs to, but that's how we can really build a responsive grid with AutoFit. Another grid class that we can use is called UGrid Custom. So if we go ahead and rename this to be our custom grid, it's just going to be a one column grid by default, but we can control the column count for each breakpoint. So here on desktop, I might switch that to be a four column grid. I might leave it four columns on tablet. On the next breakpoint, we might switch it to be two columns and maybe it stays that way all the way down. So if we want really fine control over what happens on each breakpoint, we can add a grid custom. Now, another good use case for the grid custom utility is say we want children to span multiple columns. Well, this grid is just a one column grid by default, but that's perfectly fine. We can leave it that way and we can select this child and give it a column to utility. So it's spanning over two columns. Now, by default, grids have to be at least as wide as their children. So because this child is spanning two columns, this grid just automatically creates an extra column for us. And now it's a two column grid. Now, if we want to position maybe this other child, we can give it a column one utility. So it spans one column, but then we can also choose what column it starts on. So if we have this start on the third column, we have two columns here, one column here. So the entire parent is a three column grid now. Or if we have this start on the fourth column, we have two columns here, an empty column of space. And now this entire parent is a four column grid. So this really helps when it comes time to make it responsive, because instead of reducing the column count on each breakpoint and the children's settings here on tablet, I only had to affect one element. So I could have this start back in its auto column. So it's right underneath the other one. And then I can have it span two columns, just like the title is. And I've only had to adjust one element and the entire parent is back to being a two column grid. The grid classes that I use the most are probably the desktop, tablet, and landscape classes. With each of these, they're set to our main column count by default, which is a 12 column design in this case. And we can leave that as is, or we can change it if we'd like. I might go with a six column grid in this case. And then on this header here, I might set this to span three of the six. So it goes halfway. And on this content, I might set it to span two of the six. And we could have this in, uh, pushed over by a column if we want, or we can just leave it on the other side. And that's the key difference between this and the previous method is with the previous one, the grid always had to end where the last element ended. And here we can have extra columns of empty space because we're defining the column count on this grid. Now for lower breakpoints, what happens here is right below desktop, this is going to switch from a display grid 
to a vertical flex. So both elements go full width. And the advantage to that is we don't have to change the column settings on this breakpoint for the children here. So usually if this was still in a grid, it would be forcing the grid to be at least three columns wide. But because we changed the parent to flex, now we don't have to update these column settings on the children. They're just automatically gonna stack under each other and go full width right below the desktop breakpoint. And we can change this to wrap wherever we want. So if we rename this to be the tablet version instead, then on desktop and tablet, we have a display grid and right below tablet, it switches to a vertical flex. And we have the same thing, but for landscape, we can go ahead and rename this to the landscape class. And that means on desktop, tablet and landscape, it's grid and right below landscape, it's vertical flex. And we didn't have to adjust these columns on the children at all. Subgrid is another grid class we have, and it's great for when we want a grid inside of a grid. So on this outer parent element, I might apply our grid custom class and change that from a one column to our main column count so it matches our 12 column design. Then on this inner element here, I might apply the grid subgrid class, and that turns on grid, and the column count on this will be based on how many columns it's spanning. So right now it's spanning one column, so this will be a one column grid but we can change this to maybe start on the second column and we might want it to go all the way to the second to last column in the list. So let's go ahead on this ending and set this to go to negative two. So it goes to the second to last column. So now this is spanning 10 of the 12 columns. And because of that, this subgrid is now a 10 column grid. So we could have 10 items side by side inside here. Now on this child here, let's go ahead and give this a column full utility and that just starts when the first of the parent's columns and spans to the very last one, negative one. So that's filling all 10 of the parent columns. And on this other child, let's also give that a column full utility, but we're going to want to indent this. So we'll actually have it start on the fourth column out of 10. So it starts one, two, three, four, right there. And it goes to the very last column. Now, what's great about this is if we change this inner element here, and maybe we decide we want it to start on the third and go to negative three. Um, so now this is spanning eight columns out of the parent 12 column grid. And this has automatically been updated to be an eight column grid inside of here. And so here we can really easily control our responsiveness. So I might leave this here and on tablet and on the very last breakpoint, I might have this start on the first column and end on the last column. And then on this paragraph content element, we might have it start on the first column as well. And then we might select the entire parent grid here and change our column count back to one. And we've made this whole thing responsive. Now the last grid class we have is the breakout grid. And this is if we want an element to go to the edge of the screen. Now we're gonna move this layout outside of our container and we'll delete the container. And then on this layout element, let's add a ugrid breakout class. Now, if our main site is a 12 column grid, well, this breakout is adding an extra column to each side. So this becomes a 14 column grid. And those two outer columns fill up all the remaining space. So here, this outer region of all 14 columns is called the full region. And this inner region of the 12 columns is our content region. So on this first element here, let's add a column custom utility and let's set it to start on the content region. So it starts right within the space and we can set it to span six of the 12 so that it's just going to the halfway mark. Now on this visual, let's give it a column custom utility and we might want it to start, we could try saying start on the seventh column, but you'll notice it's actually underneath this element now because this first space counts as a column. So this is column one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we actually want this to start on eight if we want it to start at the halfway point. And in this case though, I'm gonna say start on nine. So it's pushed over by a column. Now for the ending, we can set this to end maybe on the content region. And if we do that, it'll go all the way to the edge of the content, or we can set it to end within the full region and it will go all the way to the edge of the whole screen, regardless of how wide our screen is. Now here on tablet, we might select this element and we might change this to end on the content region. And that way it just goes kind of full width here. 
And then for this visual, we can either set it to start on the full region, so that way it extends off both sides here, or maybe we want it to start on the content region on this side, and then go to the full region on the other side, or maybe it stays within content region on both. So we have all those options here. And then on the smallest breakpoint here, we keep our outer two columns, and then this inner content region changes from a 12 column to be a one column so that we don't have all of our gaps overflowing here. So that's really how the breakout grid works, and that's a high-level overview of the grid classes found in Lumos.